Dr. Alice Gorman. Uh, the She's an Associate Professor, College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences there in Adelaide with Flinders University. Alice, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Chris. Uh, Alice, uh, you've been contributing to the Australian Space Magazine uh, and you've also just published a book and we caught up just a couple of weeks ago at the Powerhouse Museum uh, here in Sydney. So we've got a lot to uncover, but you're quite unique in the industry. You're a space archaeologist. Uh, so basically, I think that gives you a license to cover anything you like uh, in the space domain. But yeah, how do you go about your work as a space archaeologist? And then we'll touch on, on the book that you've just published with Routledge. Well, so I'm interested in, in human artefacts off Earth, uh, Earth orbit, uh, on the surface of the moon and other planets, uh, in orbit around other planets and deep space probes. So uh, it's a challenging field to work in because, uh, you know, archaeology is a field-based discipline. And, um, you know, going into the field outside Earth is not really possible for me at this moment. So <laughs> a lot of my work is um, uh, using uh, images, documentary records, um, tracking data, um, stuff like that. So I'm kind of working remotely. Um, but there's, there's, you know, such interesting questions about... Um, the cultural heritage of space and so much to be done even with these kind of data well i wish uh and i don't know if it was recorded but the powerhouse museum talk that you gave with carly noon uh was about an hour fire, fireside chat uh and she's contributed to the to the routledge book this is the routledge handbook of social studies of outer space uh it was a fascinating discussion and very broad and uh thought provoking too in a number of different areas I suppose one of the initial questions for the audience who don't know you is how did you get into space? Was it a, just a selection of space or did you fall into this domain or you started to study archaeology with space in mind? It basically came about because uh, as a little kid, my two main ambitions were to be an astrophysicist or an archaeologist. And long story, I'm not going to tell it now, but I ended up going down the archaeology path. And as a mature person, like I was a professional heritage consultant, I had a PhD in archaeology, and I just had a revelation one day that everything out in space was an archaeological record and I could do archaeology on it. So it was kind of putting back together those two passions that had been separated. Uh, and to me, it, you know, it just made perfect sense. And I think one aspect of what I've done is, 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 pursuing this inside the space community. So it's really important to me to be part of, you know, our Australian space world and, and the sort of more global space world as well. So I'm kind of not on the outside looking in. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm half studying myself as well. Like I'm on the inside feeling part of this kind of global network of space people. So I think that's important. Yeah, I agree. I think the study of space is you are studying history, you know, in a, in a long, long uh, aspect of that. We just did an event in Canberra with the ANU, Australian uh, National University, and on the panel, we are looking at space medicine for earthlings and had a philosopher. So there was a lot of questions there of why are we going back to space? Uh, what does space mean mm -hmm. for us? Uh, and, and those domains, so we look, tend to look forward in that. What would be some of the sort of fallout learnings that you've had along the way, uh, sort of those real moments where you've found that you've really either made a dis uh, discovery or you, you've you sort of uncovered something that maybe you didn't have in mind when you first started? I suppose uh, one aspect of this is, is it's kind of incremental. So I've found as I've worked on different things, so I've done a lot of work looking at uh, space debris in Earth orbit. Um, I think about the moon because I come from a, a heritage consulting background on Earth, so I'm used to working as part of large EIS teams. So that kind of um, gives me a perspective on looking at human activities on the moon. And I've also had a project doing the archaeology of the International Space Station. So the kind of end result, putting all of this together, is coming to realise that 
in the space community, we, we have a sort of a narrative of what we're doing and why we're doing that. And we're used to it, so it seems normal to us, but it is often very discordant for people outside the space community who are like, why are we going to the moon? Why are we mining the moon? Why are we spending so much money putting rockets into space? So I think one of the important things, um, taking a cultural approach to our space history and space activities is to firstly recognise those massive gaps between what, how we understand what we're doing, how the public understands what they're doing, and coming up with stories to bridge that gap that come from those places and objects. So I kind of think that's a that's a really important part of what I do. It'd be hard to say, have I discovered a thing? What I've kind of discovered, I guess, is different perspectives and um, how useful. So another thing that I'm working on at the moment is how do we describe the lunar environment? So, you know, in our heads, we can see those sort of black and white photographs that we get from the lunar orbiting spacecraft that, that map the moon all the time. And of course, the Apollo images, much close, closer up on the surface. And you probably just think, oh, you know, that's just like, in fact, one of the interesting things is people often think that photographs were taken in black and white on the surface of the moon and they were actually taken in colour. Yeah. But they kind of look black and white because there's minimal colour variation. So you kind of dismiss it. You think, well, that's the moon, it's it's grey, it's dead. But I think that's inadequate to describe an environment which soon is going to be heavily impacted because people are going to be mining it and yeah. landing things on it and blowing the dust away. So, and congratulations to the ISRO who just landed on back on the moon uh, this this week. Um, but this is leading because I took notes from your talk. You are working on a space solar system sustainability index. Is this uh, yes, this where is you're cool. heading to? Is this uh, what you have in mind? Yeah. Um, so actually, we, we're kind of touching on two books today. So we'll talk a bit more about the Routledge Handbook of the Social Studies of Outer Space. I'm sure. Yes. But I am writing another book um, building on um, Dr. Space Junk versus the Universe, which I published in right. 2019. Um, and part of that is, is, you know, opening up the context and looking at the space environment and this index that I'm working on. And I'll, I'll, I'll be up front, Chris. <laughs> Mathematically, I'm probably going to have to ask for some help. So I haven't figured out how to make the index work as I want. But the, the idea of the index is you can, using the age of a sun, the number of planets in a solar system and the degree to which um, anthropogenic or the activity of a potentially other sentient or technological um, species has irreversibly damage the capacity of that planet or moon or whatever to support life or sustain life. So it's a way of uh, calculating so the amount of opportunity represented by the length, the, the age of the solar system, depending on the sun, the number of planets or celestial bodies that you could potentially ruin, uh, and then coming up with a number to say, well, where do you fit on this scale? Like, do you have a good uh, index of solar system sustainability? So you haven't irreversibly um, destroyed celestial bodies in your solar system, or do you have a bad one? Now, okay, we've only got one solar system to judge this on, but people are studying exoplanets. Yep. We know the other ones are out there. So where do, where do we sit in this scale at the moment we haven't yet irreversibly damaged a celestial body to the point where no one or no living thing can live on it again. So, and we've only messed up potentially one. Uh, <laughs> yes, planet in our solar we've system. only had one to mess up. So we've, we're at a hundred percent at the moment, right? <laughs> so we, the moon is now going to enter into this equation. So we're probably <clears throat> like in my potential scale of zero to one. Uh, where one is the worst and zero is the best. So maybe we're like 0.5 or something or 0.2. So we're not bad. So that's kind of to say, well, 
it could get worse and we might may not measure up well in this index in the future. Well, we might. I think what one thing is it, it raises questions and then we might well avoid uh, sort of damaging the uh, our, our solar system more than what we seem to be doing otherwise to our own planet. And uh, again, even the Russians uh, crashing into the moon uh, and the like, we're already putting sort of space junk on onto the surface of the moon uh, as we go along. Um, so look, Fascinating. I don't know. I won't put a time uh, frame on you to to come out with that, but I Thank can see you. the I can see the way you can think you are thinking. So maybe <laughs> let's talk to about your chapter in the Routledge Handbook of Social Studies of Outer Space. Um, this obviously these these sort of publications by Routledge. This is a handbook, so there's a lot of content uh, in this particular uh, edition. What was your contribution? So the, the handbook is edited by me and Juan Salazar, who many people will know from University of Western Sydney. And I have to pay tribute to Juan because it was his original vision. Uh, he asked me to come on later. And he, I, uh, I feel he has sort of really crafted this book and brought it to the conclusion. So I just want to acknowledge wow. the tremendous amount of thinking and hard work that he did. Um, so that it's you know it's a handbook and the idea about a handbook is that it's it provides you with up to date overviews of the state of the discipline and it also gives you original uh theories and ideas like cutting edge research that people are doing and the idea behind this one is the space world has not enough taken account of what uh, humanities and social sciences have to offer. So your mention of the philosopher at this other panel is really interesting. So the handbook is really meant to demonstrate what's missing and what we can learn. So my contribution, I've got two chapters in the handbook. Uh, one is kind of a, uh, an overview of what space archaeology and space heritage are. So if, if you know, this is if you're one of these people thinking, I do not understand why those two <laughs> words go together. So this is a chapter that will kind of explain everything. So it's kind of an account of the discipline. And I also have a chapter, the final chapter in the book, uh, which is about gravity, one of my obsessions. That was another takeaway from your talk uh, <laughs> I had as well, the different types of gravity. So... Basically, you know, we think we live in one Earth gravity and most of the time, not all of it, but most of the time, it's constant. Like we don't think about it. We don't factor it into um, at the decisions we make. Uh, it's just there, you know. But uh, if you think of Elon Musk's uh, thing about humans becoming an interplanetary species, a concept which we could spend hours talking about, one of the aspects of that, it, it's not just being on another planet, it's living in a completely different gravity setting. Yeah. And we know for the crews of Earth orbiting space stations, this creates such a wide range of challenges from the health staff to just doing, you know, everyday activities like washing yourself or cleaning your teeth or sleeping, it affects everything. So our sample of living in different gravities is pretty small. And soon people are expected to be on the moon in yep. one sixth Earth gravity. So I guess this chapter is is about um, looking at what are the social consequences of living in a different kind of gravity. Well, I, we, we we literally talked about this at uh, the Australian National University this week uh, at Space Medicine for Earthlings, and it was proposed that you know when we think about we want to colonize Mars. Uh, humans born on Mars may not be able to come back to Earth because they their legs and their bone structure won't be as strong because uh, gravity mm. assists with bone structure and, uh, you know, broken bones won't mend as well in space because they need to be weight-bearing uh, and the like and so it might take longer. But uh, the human body will evolve and change if it's born off Earth uh, with gravity being a, a primary uh, reason for that and may not be able to return back to Earth. And it was a bit of a very thought-provoking, uh, and this was a medical doctor sort of explaining this, is 
yeah, it's it's likely that we will evolve way beyond what our current human body is, uh, and gravity plays a big part. And the other uh, aspect I, I uh, took out of your talk is humans seek out different gra gravities. Uh, you know, thinking about the roller coaster, and I thought that was quite insightful too. Yeah, like if you think about it, every amusement park or fairground, or you know, the local agricultural and horticultural show you take your kids you look at some sheep some pumpkins and the kids go on the rides they're about experiencing different gravity so and even down to the simple swing right even children oh, on a swing perfect example perfect example so so we're on the one hand we don't notice one earth gravity because it's the background to everything we do but on the other hand we seek out these different experiences of gravity which I think culturally is just really fascinating. I'm probably going to do some more research around that. Well, look, um, I, I could. I, we did warn ourselves uh, before we started this conversation <laughs> that uh, we could go for at least another hour. I'd love to do a, a, a live fireside chat with you, Alice, because again, we can cover such a broad area. Um, your last contribution in the Australian uh, Australian Space Magazine was Daniel Joinby, who's the managing director with Gundaji Aerospace. Um, uh, how do you how do you find this is a sort of the Doctor Space Junk presents five questions. Uh, how do you find your guests within within that? Maybe we'll finish off on who stands out to you within the industry that you like to talk to. Mm. Uh, so this it has been my pleasure to have this regular uh, column in the magazine. Um, the five questions I ask potential people, and I guess you know I'm looking for someone. We've got a lot of people doing amazing stuff out there and they don't often get an opportunity to be, you know, in the spotlight or talk about their work as, as, as much as we might like. So I guess I'm always looking for people who are doing something interesting that I think other people deserve to know about. And I have to say, uh, I think Daniel Joinby, um, uh, you know, a young Indigenous um, aircraft engineer who's now moving into the space world, to me he's an outstanding example of exactly the kind of person we want more of in this industry and uh if you think if anyone listening thinks they have the kind of story or background like it's very casual like it's not the yep, the yep. questions designed to help us get to know the person so if if you think you might be a good candidate for dr space junk prevents presents five questions with you're very welcome to get in touch well, look, it's great. Um, we'll have all these links in the show notes. We'll have a link to the Routledge Handbook of Social Studies of Outer Space. It was literally, the, this is the first edition, but published uh, in July. So it's uh, hot yep. off the printing press. Uh, we'll have a, uh, have the links to uh, your uh, contributions in the Australian Space Magazine. And I think a link through to Flinders University uh, to your profile as well. Um, and maybe one call to action. You've got uh, an event coming up. Uh, what, what's uh, what's next for you that you think the audience, audience might like to be aware of? So uh, there's um, an international NGO, the International Council of Monuments and Sites. They're an advisory body to UNESCO on heritage matters. We have just formed an international scientific committee on aerospace heritage, which covers the, the cultural heritage of outer space and the natural heritage to a degree as well. Next week, in um, starting on the 31st of August, they're having their General Assembly in Sydney. And this will be the first time this committee uh, is meeting in person and discussing these issues. So aerospace heritage, particularly space heritage, is now on the international agenda. And I guess the call to action is if you thought this was fluffy social science you didn't have to think about, well, think again. Wonderful. We'll, we'll have any links into that particularly. This will be out uh, as of the 28th of August. But uh, Dr. Alice Gorman, thank you so much. You're the, with the Associate Professor, College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences at Flinders University in Adelaide. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Space Junk. Thank you, Chris.